got a great topic for everybody. If you couldn't already tell, client power save management and Wi-Fi. Uh, myself, uh, Don Cook, I'm the chief marketing officer here at Seven Signal. We've got Mike Graham, a senior sales engineer, who we were just talking a few minutes ago. You've been here for what did we say? Seven years? A little over seven years? Yeah. Now, Mike. Yeah. Congrats on that work anniversary. Just amazing. Uh, Heather Dremel, the shortest termer here, um, just with us a little over two months. She's our digital marketing manager. And of course, Mr. Jim Vada, uh, CWNE 183, our chief wireless officer. Uh, and he's been here a, a little little less than me, maybe, just or maybe a little over three years now. Just over three years, yeah. Just like me. Well, cool. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand the controls over to Mr. Graham, and maybe Jim can give us a little bit more background around Mike today. Yeah, happy to. Thanks, Don. And and uh, if you haven't uh, been on a webinar with Mike yet, he's uh, a sales engineer with us in the southeast here in the U.S. Uh, like you heard, he's he's got seven years at Seven Signal, so a lot of experience um, and. Uh, does pre-sales engineering and supports some of our largest customers. So really happy to have you on the on the webinar today, Mike. Always a pleasure. All right. All right. So um, today we're going to be talking about some of the power management uh, schemes. And I'd originally sort of intended this to, to do a little bit of deep dive and, and found the topic was was maybe broader than I thought. Um, so it's now a survey or an overview of, uh, of power management. Um, we've organized it by um, 802.11.5, uh, by the version of, of uh, Wi-Fi. Um, it's gonna be talking about legacy, um, ABG, talking about 802.11.n, uh, AC and finally AX. Um, one thing that I I did discover is that uh, legacy power management is still very much in use. Uh, so it has has not gone away at all. Um, what do you say, Jim? Yeah, for sure. Um, surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly, because backwards compatibility is so important um to the uh, protocol creators we still do see legacy power save uh, in use even today 20 years later yeah whenever i uh, i was preparing this uh, i did a lot of you know looking at frames to kind of verify where things were um so that if if it came up i wouldn't get it wrong or if i put it in the slideshow it would be right but uh I had no problem at all finding examples of uh, PS poll um, in just packet captures that I had lying around. I didn't have to go to go looking for them. So uh, still very much in use. Um, and uh, you know, just a few bullet points on on the background for it. It is the only power saving that that was specified in, in legacy data to eleven networks. Uh, it is, and if we had this, we would have we would have probably gotten the ATEM uh, question right, or at least better. It's only available in infrastructure mode, not uh, as an ad hoc. Um, it, other than some latency, it it acts like it's always on. You you stay quote connected to the access point, um, and uh, you periodically. Uh, poll the airwaves, um, and you look at the TIM and uh, DTIM frames or uh, elements and the beacons rather to uh, to see if there's anything waiting for you. Um, you know, on the downside, it is uh, got a couple of hundred milliseconds of uh, of latency, so not going to be great for for VoIP um, and. Uh, you know, the access point has to buffer the packets for you. Um, and uh, wanted to just kind of sort of, and once again, I'm, you know, I'm not gonna, not gonna show packet captures. I, I tried and, and they don't seem to work well on, on slideshows. So I just thought I would do a sort of a descriptive 
description of, of what the protocol looks like. So, you know, when a station gets ready to, to go to sleep, it's going to send a, a null frame with the power management bit set to the access point. It's saying, I'm going to sleep. Let me know if you have any frames uh, waiting for me. And then it's going to periodically wake up. It'll receive a beacon. It's going to look at the the TIM element, uh, and it's going to check the bit mask, and it's going to look for its AID there in the, the uh, in the the uh, bit map. And, and before I did this, I had always just kind of read over that and, and not really looked at what the the partial partial virtual bit map was. Uh, you know, I uh, I just accepted that it was there, but I decided to look into it and uh, found out how it works. And there's there's actually 207 or 208 um, bit long bit mask. It's truncated if there's if there's not that many stations attached to the access point, and I think there's rarely 2,007 stations attached to an access point. Uh, so it gets truncated down, so it's it's usually not transmitting a, that long of a a map. But uh, when the station associates to the access point, it gets an association ID from one to two thousand and seven, and it checks the bit that represents that AID if it's set, and that's how it knows. And I really, you know, I. Obviously, it's legacy, but I'd never really looked into that bitmap before, so uh, um, that's that's something that I I know now. There, there is a a bit for each AID for each association ID, and that's that's how it knows. Um, but if the station wakes up and it sees that the the bit for its AID is set, it's going to send a PS poll. Power safe pole to the access point, and the access point is going to send it a frame, uh, and that frame will either have the more data bit set or not. Uh, if it is set, it's going to continue to pole and retrieve those frames, um, and if it's not set, it's going to go back to sleep. So that's that's the basic logic behind it, and something you might know, Jim, that that I looked around for a little bit and and did not find is can a client, when it sees that it has data pending, can it send another null frame with the power management bit cleared, thereby telling the access point it's waking up and have the AP forward all those frames, or does it need to pull them one by one? Do you know, yeah, it, Jim, because yeah. I couldn't find the answer. I believe with uh, WMM power save, that's how it works. The the yeah, um, a single null data uh, frame uh, empties the the AP's buffer. I'm not sure with the legacy mode. It might be uh, you might have to go frame by frame. Yeah, that's that's what I I seem to find, but uh, I couldn't actually find any any hard confirmation on that. Um, yeah, Q and A anyway. says um, one by one, as far as I recall, for legacy mode. So, thank you, Chris, for weighing in there. Okay, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't sure and couldn't find confirmation on that. One of the questions I wanted to ask was how much power is actually saved by by these, and the information is really really sketchy as far as, as hard numbers. Um, so I found one hardware manufacturer that said their receiver drew about 85 milliamps when fully active and about three and a half on average in uh, PS polling power save mode. Uh, so that's 95%. I think that's, that's really good. Um, but the expense is, Lots of latency. Um, you know, you have to you uh, you have to wake up. You have to see those those Tim elements and see if you're in it. Um, 
and then wake up and, and send a poll. So all of that seems to add a couple hundred milliseconds to uh, to receiving those frames. So if you're doing, you know, voice or really anything kind of hard real time, it's just not going to work very well for you. Uh, and I think we've we've seen that uh, lots of times before, Jim. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, because you have to wait for that um, DTIM um, information element in the beacon. You know, the shortest uh, wait or or sleep interval would be about 100 milliseconds. Um, yeah. And therefore, you know, there's a lot of real-time applications like voice especially that that's going to be a problem for. Absolutely. It did surprise me that it was hard to find good hard information on how much power it, it saved. It's so old that that I expected there to be a lot of studies and, and there don't seem to be. So, uh, you know, that might be a, uh, a good project for somebody with the equipment to, to measure the power draw on the radios is to, to do a paper on, on how much power savings each of the mode does with different applications. I would love to read that. Moving on to to N, um, you know the the one that really is is heavily used is Wi-Fi multimedia automatic power save delivery. Uh, and as an industry, we come up with some horrible names, uh, but it it comes in two flavors, uh, unscheduled and scheduled. Uh, I'm only talking about unscheduled here. I didn't find a lot of in uh, information that the scheduled version was was really implemented widely. Um, if anybody knows knows different, please uh, let us know. But uh, the unscheduled version is implemented widely, um, and it it really um, simplifies things quite a bit from uh, PS polling, I think, and always in favor of that. But you know, we still or the station will still set that power management bit uh, to go to sleep, just like in, in PS polling. But instead of the whole waiting for a beacon, um, uh, any of, of uh, that, the station, uh, the station triggers the AP to dump any of its buffered frames by simply transmitting any packet uh, to, the, uh, to the access point. Um, so no, no more of that, that waiting around. It sends a, sends a frame and the, uh, the access point, uh, understands that it's awake and, and starts sending, sending back. So, you know, greatly reduces the latency. Um, and, you know, from the name wireless multimedia, uh, you kind of would expect that, that it's going to be good for interactive media applications. And it is. Uh, it works super well for voice over IP uh, because those devices, you know, your handheld phone or whatever, uh, and Ascon actually has a has some nice documentation out on on how this all works. Um, but it's gonna it's gonna crank out a frame every 20 milliseconds or so to transmit the the voice, you know, speaking side. Um, and then that will trigger the access point to send whatever frame that it has buffered from the other half of the call. So it works beautifully in, uh, in voice over IP applications, uh, basically designed for it. Um, once again, hard to find uh, documentation on the power. Uh, I did find one, um, <laughs> one person or actually one, one company, it was a corporate paper, um, where they clearly couldn't do math because their math indicated that it actually charged the battery, uh, it produced power rather than, than consuming it. But I think what they meant uh, once I dug through was that the power savings are about 75% on VoIP applications over over staying active all the time. Uh, anything to add on that, Jim? 
Well, this is um, by far um, WMMPS is the uh, most commonly used power save mechanism uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, it's very, very widely implemented and and used. So, uh, yeah, when I was looking for examples, uh, a few examples of some some uh, power save mechanisms that are uh, in the standard, but not really implemented or required by any certification. So this, is, this would be the one to really focus on for sure. Yeah. And, and I, you know, just like PS polling, I didn't have any problems finding, you know, examples in the wild of, of this in use. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, very much used and very appropriate for VoIP uh, like applications. Yeah, comment the other from one. the uh, from the um, chat. Landon says uh, for VoIP, he's saying uh, thirty to sixty percent um, improvement uh, in uh, in power um, preservation with uh, okay. WMMPS. Nice to know that. Um, yeah, definitely, it doesn't charge the battery. <laughs> Some people's math is really bad. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the other one that I was able to, to find at least some indication that it was was used a little bit um, was the spatial multiplexing power save. Uh, and it's, it's pretty straightforward uh, as well. If you've got a two, three, or four stream MIMO device, uh, it just powers down to a single stream. Um, and uh, it can switch between those those modes, uh, either static one stream all the time, dynam uh, dynamic, which uh, fires up the rest of the streams when it's actually communicating, um, or of course off altogether. And that's in the HT capabilities element uh, in association and reassociation frames. Um, so that's that's how that is is controlled uh, and it does seem to be used uh, at least a little bit. Yeah I've uh, certainly seen um, I think um, association requests from clients that indicate they support SMPS and it seems like a really good idea. I'm a little curious why it's not really broadly supported um, because all those extra radio chains, that's a lot of power they use, and often you don't need them all. So seems like a good idea. Absolutely. And you know, we see all the time that access points, whenever they add, you know, more radio chains, suddenly it goes from PoE to PoE plus. So absolutely a uh, a major power savings there. Yeah, for sure. Um and the other, um, what is it? PS multi, MP power state multipole. I that's another one that I didn't find too much evidence that was actually in use. So uh, did not did not cover that one. Yeah, I think that's part of the HCF channel access um, uh, protocol, and yeah, I, I think very little implementation of that. Yeah. Um, and then AC, 802.11ac, Wi-Fi 5, uh, it introduced um, VHT, uh, TX Op Power Save, and once again, terrible acronyms in the industry, very high throughput, transmit opportunity, power save. Um, this one, I, uh, I had to do a little bit of digging around in to, uh, to find out exactly where all the the bits were that controlled it, but um, it's actually in the preamble part of the of the frame, um, and there is an association ID in there, uh, very much like PS polling. Uh, the algorithm to generate it is different, um, but the station can check during the uh, the reception of the preamble. 
whether or not it is a recipient of the frame. And since it is um, MU-MIMO, you know, there can be multiple recipients um, of data in that frame. Uh, but if, it's, if a station is not one, it can look at the duration field and shut down its receiver for the rest of the transmission. So I think, you know, I love this one. It's, it's just so simple. When somebody else is talking and they're not talking to me, I can go to sleep. Uh, I love yeah, it when just, things get simpler. It makes so much sense, and especially in um, 11AC where everything's sent in AM PDU format, you know, with aggregated frames that may, may have multiple destinations um, and potentially longer TX ops. Uh, it just it makes a lot of sense. So very handy. Yeah, I, uh, I really liked it. Uh, I like this one. I thought this was, you know, this one was both obvious and clever. And then 802.11 AX. I, I, I actually had a lot of trouble finding really good documentation on, on this one. And I did find an Aruba white paper that uh, I don't think I linked to, but I probably should have because it's, it's really good. But uh, you can you can do a search for the uh, Aruba white paper on uh, power management in 802.11ax, and it's it's very good. But it introduced target wake up time, really targeted towards low power, long sleep time IoT type devices. So you know if if it's a meter that that needs to report, you know once or twice a day or something like that it's ideal because you can do very long uh sleep times and also you have to negotiate with the access point to schedule a wake up time uh, so the access point can schedule its clients for non-overlapping times so when the client wakes up there's not going to be anybody else talking on the network it's you know he's scheduled for that time uh, and that's obviously something that that ax um, kind of runs through the changes in ax is, is a little more uh, deterministic scheduling um, but there's three flavors of it individual um, target wake up time and that's where the AP and the station will negotiate a wake up time for the individual client. And the client proposes a time and the access point can agree or it can, um, can offer an alternate time. Um, broadcast, and this is for things like multicast, the access point will announce a wake up time uh, to multiple clients. Uh, so they can all wake up to receive things like multicast. Um, and then opportunistic, the AP is going to announce a wake-up time, and then all the clients in that group are going to wake up at that time, and they will have to go through the normal contention for the medium, uh, as opposed to the individual, where the AP schedules clients uh, for individual wake-up times. Uh, I did not actually find uh, too much of this, but I think that that is simply because uh, AX is, is still rolling out, and uh, um, I just didn't have a lot of examples of it. Uh, what do you think, Jim? Well, it's a really useful feature, particularly, particularly for IoT, and yeah. that's a little trivia, uh, target weight, uh, wake time came to 802.11 first with uh, the 802.11ah amendment uh, for Wi-Fi Halo uh, a little bit before AX, but AX is what brings us into the you know the mainstream high throughput FIs within uh, within uh, 802.11. That's where uh, target wake time got added for those. The big distinction here is that where the previous um, power save mechanisms gave you, you know, microseconds or even milliseconds of uh, sleep time where you could power down the radio. This is designed for IoT devices that might want to sleep for minutes or hours, 
In fact, that sleep period can go as long as 24 hours. Um, so it's really, you know, designed for sensors and, and uh, you know, kind of that narrowly defined class of IoT devices that just need to send and receive data very, very infrequently uh, on the network and otherwise would be much better off asleep for serving battery. Yeah, um, we actually have a, a customer that has Wi-Fi enabled soap dispensers in their bathroom uh, and they kind of fit in that class because, you know, they only need to update the central server uh, very rarely on, on what the, the soap level in them is. But I thought it was a little bit funny, but it, uh, it kind of gives an example of just how many things can fall into that class. So, uh, and of course the potential for power savings are immense on this if you can turn off the radio for hours at a time. Um, and then I have uh, a little diagram also lifted from Aruba. Thank you very much, Aruba. Uh, that, that demonstrates uh, sort of that transaction uh, for, for individual we can see over on the left that they, uh, the AP and the, and the client will negotiate a time. And then it, at some point in the future, the client's gonna wake up, wait for a trigger frame, upload its data or do its transactions and go back to sleep. Um, and I don't think I mentioned it, but that wake up time, it can be a one-time thing or you can schedule a recurring, at least that's, my understanding. Um, the broadcast, we can see there that, you know, the, the uh, stations will wake up all simultaneously and wait to hear the information. And finally, the, the opportunistic, we can see down here that the stations are, are you know, potentially competing for the medium. Um, I wanted to mention a few of the articles that I found on the web that I thought were uh, extremely helpful. Uh, the names that you see or whatever was on the about for their, their web page. So one amongst the many software professionals who look at computer screen most of the day. Thank you very much. Um, but these are some great references. Um, Aruba, as I have mentioned, has some wonderful white papers and uh, Cisco has a few too. So uh, that is the conclusion. All right, thanks Mike. And uh, we have a little bit of time for Q&A and I wanna invite anybody uh, out there in the audience that has a question, drop it in the Q&A panel. Um, let's see, how about uh, one from Jonathan here. Um, and uh, interested in if the audience has seen this either, because this is new to me, but he says, have you seen an issue with Qualcomm AC Wave 2 chipsets that do not acknowledge PS pole frames? And uh, no, I haven't experienced that myself. Mike, have, have you seen that at all? I've not seen that or heard about that at all. Yep, yep, new to me too. So if anybody out there has heard of that, uh, uh, drop us a note. Um, question from shocking how how established that is. You'd think that would be right. Yeah, and that's probably Sorry. a hard thing to troubleshoot. You know, you need a packet capture to be able to see what's going on there. But the behavior for the end user is probably pretty strange. Yeah, catastrophic. Yeah. Uh, Landon says, uh, and maybe another good one for the audience, but uh, have you seen the Meraki bug where legacy client, a legacy client's association ID never clears? Uh, for example, it triggers uh, constant null frames and can literally melt your client. Literally meaning figuratively, I think. <laughs> No, I haven't seen that one, Landon. Sounds like uh, you've had some bad luck with some some code. And he does say in all caps, no, literally. 
So he's got some serious Wi-Fi issues with melting clients. <laughs> that is very serious. Um, yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that. I have seen an instance where um, Cisco Aeronet access points transmit a null frame between every data frame but it doesn't, didn't have anything to do with uh, an AID issue. Yeah. And a uh, uh, comment here from uh, Jermund up in Norway, friend of Seven Signal. He says, um, uh, regarding the VHT uh, TX op power save, he says, I think in VHT, it's a partial association ID in the VHT preamble that stations can use as an early warning if the frame uh, is to an association ID uh, in his area or not. If the partial AID of the station, if it is, um, it could skip receiving the rest of the frame. So there you have it. Yep. It would be a little strange to have a big full list of association IDs in the preamble. That'd be a pretty big preamble. Yeah. It is a partial. The 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 algorithm is documented. Um, I found it, uh, I had to look for it a little bit, but I found it um, and it just, it, it was deeper than I wanted to go in this to, to put that in there. But yeah, it is a, it is a partial, partial map. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe one last question here from Jonathan. Um, he asks, is this conversation implying that IoT devices should have a separate Wi-Fi network for data, voice, and video from the network uh, for IoT devices? I think he's he's asking if IoT devices should have their own network separate from typical Wi-Fi um, devices. Uh, I mean, I would tend to just because I like the organization that way, but I'm, I don't think you need one for, for the power save to work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, a lot of times there's segmentation done at layer two with, with separate SSIDs for IOT devices, because yeah. a lot of them won't do 802.1X. So you have to have a PSK network just for them. And in that case, you could configure a, a power save mechanism really tailored for them. Um, you can also, you know, increase that DTEM quite a bit. One of the things you can do with uh, legacy power save mode, because it's set to that beacon interval in, in terms of when all the clients have to wake up and look look in the in the TIM for their association ID. You can set a DTIM interval so it's not every beacon, but every third beacon maybe. And then you get a longer sleep time and better battery life or power uh, preservation on those devices. At the expense, of course, yeah. with multiplying the amount of latency you get uh, by that, uh, that DTIM interval. So you have to really tailor it to the application requirements. Yeah, but in a... In a device that's not latency sensitive, you can absolutely increase those values. Yep. And uh, um, I think that wraps it up. One last comment here from the audience. Looks like uh, David from Mamonides uh, thanks you for sharing your knowledge today. So appreciate all that uh, positive feedback. There's a lot of good feedback in the Q&A. Thanks, guys.